Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our Lady Day lecture. The clock is chiming at the RAU at the moment, and so it, it heralds that it's time to start. I thought before I introduced our speaker and the speaker lead today, I'd just say a little bit about Lady Day, because when I read that it was a Lady Day lecture, I thought I should look up and see what the significance of this was, being someone who was who never studied history at school. So it obviously is, has great religious significance because it commemorates the Feast of the Annunciation when the angel Gabriel came to tell the uh, Virgin Mary she was going to be the mother of Jesus. But it also has significant farming connotations, which I wasn't aware of because when we had the Julian calendar, this was up until 1752, Lady Day was the first day of the year. And in the olden days at that time, that was when the contracts between landowners and tenants would begin. And when tenants moved to new farms, they did that on that day traditionally. So I thought it was quite appropriate to, uh, to just draw our attention to that. Now, this is um, the third, if you count the Bledisloe lecture as the first, in a series of conversations, because I think I'd like to re remind everyone this is meant to be a conversation between leading lights in the sector and our alumni about key topics of the day. And it's very much for alumni by alumni, but also for all of our stakeholders and friends and our students. And it's an enormous pleasure to introduce Sir Peter Kendall, who has been, I suppose, a giant figure in British food and farming for, a very, I shouldn't say a very long time because you may, may take that the wrong way, but you know what I mean. And I suppose when I was, uh, actually working as a vet, I remember you were uh, shaking the, the walls of Westminster. So Peter's a fifth generation farmer, so he's going to hear, tell us a bit more about that when he starts his talk. But his farm specializes in arable and poultry. And I think poultry is, a, is, a, is an area of food production that we don't hear enough about as being one of the most successful industries in the, in the farming sector. Peter was president of the NFU for eight years, and then very importantly, chair of the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board for uh, six years. And as you'll hear today, Peter's overriding passion, and I've heard him speak on this on many occasions, is the fact that British farming needs to be a business, and it needs to be not an old fashioned industry, but one that's innovative, competitive, and exciting and is absolutely central to the global challenges that face us. Peter, in, in that vein, recently led the Agricultural Productivity Working Group of the UK Food and Sector Council, which reported in February 2020, which highlighted the need for farm businesses to seize the opportunities provided by big data. And I'm sure he'll talk about that in a little while, because obviously technology is going to be key to the way that we can ensure productivity and meet some of the key challenges, such as how to meet uh, the climate change demands. Closer to home, we're very lucky that he's been a guest lecturer at the RAU's Innovation in Sustainable Food and Agriculture MBA programme. And I had had amazingly good feedback from the students as to how much they valued his, his seminar. Julie is in conversation with Peter. It's, you know, some of you may listen to, uh, you know, the Radio 4 programme, The Reunion, and it feels a little bit to me like that, and it'll become obvious as to why in a minute. So Julie was appointed as an RAU governor in 2019, and originally, I hadn't realised this, Julie, worked in the steel processing sector, and then switched to law mid-career when she joined the NFU, just as the sector was emerging from the trauma of foot and mouth in 2001. After several years as its chief legal advisor, she had a spell heading up the NFU's government affairs team. And that's when Peter and she worked very closely together. 
And I, I, and I know that you'll hear that coming through today, how well they know each other and share the passion for the same issues. Julie's now back in private practice at Roy Thorne Solicitor, and she spends her time, which I love this expression, getting farmers onto land to grow stuff. Which I thought was a lovely way of putting things in. As a director of the Oxford Farming Conference from 2016 to 2019, she had a really important role in shaping what key innovations the, those of us in the sector need to know about and is on the governing council of the Agricultural Law Association. So thank you again to both of you. And uh, I look forward very much to hearing your conversation. Thank you very much, Joe, and welcome everybody. It's great to have you all online. We promise not to keep you for longer than an hour. So grab your d &T. that should see you through the next hour while uh, you have a chance to put questions to Peter. I'm going to spend 15, 20 minutes with the, some easy questions, some warm up questions really, um, so that he can uh, put forward his view of how he sees the world, but Come on, folks, if you put some questions in the Q&A facility, I'll be watching that. And uh, we hope, tech permitting, to come to you live to ask that question. So do pile in uh, whatever you want to ask Peter about where now for production agriculture and his views on things. Do feel free to bash that into the Q&A and I'll be watching that. And we'll have, hear as much and from as many of you as uh, we can in the next hour for 55 minutes. Okay, now we've got this production agriculture that we're very familiar with, but we've got it now against a backdrop of headline challenges that we all are very familiar with, whether it's climate change, whether it's urgency around net zero carbon, loss of biodiversity and habitat, the state of of the natural environment, sustainability generally. And I, I really can't think of anyone that I'd rather quiz about this uh, than uh, Peter Kendall. He, he's one of the most public farmers that we have, and he's probably seen as a proponent of, on the side of, if you like, of intensive production methods. We might learn something different this evening, but he's probably viewed as an intensive producer and with all the negatives that that word conjures up. So let's um, try and sort of marry these things together and see how Peter in his farming uh, life uh, marries the challenges and the need to produce food together. So Peter, thank you very much for taking time to be with us. And um, as the Vice Chancellor said, you, were, you, you know, you're an active farmer. You run an arable poultry family farm in Bedfordshire. Can you just say a bit more about that really? Who's involved? What sort of scale you operate on? How are you structured? Just give us a bit of background. Yeah, my, my, bro my brother Richard is an alumni of, of Sirencester, and if he was hearing that I was up, I was now back at home running the farm, he might be shuffling slightly nervously at that thought. But look, we, my mother is 93 and still marches around the farm every morning, wanting to know what's going on, has a keen eye on black grass, annoyingly so, spots any um, make mistakes that we're making around the farm. Um, my, my late father, sadly, has been with us for 30 years. My mother's been uh, really quite involved in, in, in the family business. Brother Richard's been at the helm, certainly while I've been away doing NFU, um, which is a, really was a, a full-time commitment. Um, and what we've done is we, we looked at the, at the arable side, we looked at the removal of, of BPS, and that was when, we, you know, we were aware what was coming for some time, that the demands on the public purse, particularly the, I can be provocative of vilification, if you like, of large-scale arable farmers in the East, not being deserving of, of big subsidy checks. So we were looking to, to, to move away and, and therefore we've set up a, a, a contracting business that's separate to the family partnership. We have got a small renewables business as well um, that's kept separate. And then when we started the poultry business um, just over five years ago, we put that in a, a company structure. Um, and so we, we farmed just over 3,000 acres, some of that contracted, some of it rented, about 1,700 of it that we own um, and have bought some ourselves and some we were very fortunate to inherit. Uh, thanks. So, you know, you had quite a nice life as a <coughs> cereal, you know, cereal cropper. 
skiing holidays in winter, you know, a bit of downtime, nothing too stressful, six intensive weeks in the summer. What on earth made you go into poultry? And, and that's a serious question, really. You, you obviously didn't just fall into it. It's quite a lot of investment needed. So what brought you, what made you move into indoor broiler chicken production? Yeah, Jeff Rooker, Lord Rooker, was always great sport on this. Whenever I was doing any of you stuff, he always called me a cereal baron. Um, we, you know, with a sort of a prod in the ribs, as, as he did so. Um, no, no, look, I, what, there were a number of things. One, um, I finished doing the NFU. I thought coming back and sharpening my elbows and telling Richard that, you know, you make, make room for me back again on the family farm probably wasn't the most politic thing I could, I could do. We've been for some time looking for an alternative venture that wasn't supported. Um, again, picking up that theme of knowing that uh, the public purse was looking fairly... Um, dubiously at the money that large farms was receiving. Um, so we, we, I was spent a lot of my time, even at the NFU, traveling around looking for growth areas. We, we, we looked at layers. I remember having um, Nick Allen from AHDB at the time come and talk to us about intensive beef production. Um, we, we, we came down to broilers at the end. I think it tied in a whole number of issues. You know, we currently feed nearly 800 tons of our own wheat. Um, we've got we burn straw and this will be sacrilege to people who are paying through the nose for straw at this moment in time. We burn straw in two big biomass boilers. We've got ground source heat system in the neighboring field to four sheds. So we were able to combine a sector that was growing. Um, the poultry meat demand grows every year. We now eat more um, poultry chicken than we do um, beef, lamb, pork combined. And it, and it continues to grow at two to three percent every year, a growing profitable sector. It gave us manure, um, three and a half thousand tons of, of manure back on our arable land, which was really important. And also as we looked at the next generation, by creating, if you like, more breadth in the business, we created opportunities for one, if the farm needs to be divided at some point in the future, but also it gets more scope if the next generation want to come and get involved. The surprise one that came to me late in all of this, and the fun I've had out of it has been enormous. Um, it's, it's quite close to where I live. We've sat around the kitchen table where I'm sat now. And I've involved Emma, my wife. Richard's been involved all the time. But my kids have sat around and we've done this. We've sat with a bank. We've borrowed a shed load of, of money to start a new venture where we've taken people on. We've converted barns. And they've actually been part of the journey Whereas even today, my son is down at Exeter. I saw him click onto the team viewer to see how the chickens are growing at this moment in time. Now, you might think he's a bit sad, but they are in lockdown. Um, so we can't get in the pub, I don't think, at two in the afternoon, even down in Exeter. But it's, it's brought us to, to see a, a new venture start from scratch. And the fact it's profitable, the fact it complements, there's plenty of synergies between the arable farm, means that I'm actually you know, really pleased we made that decision. We built four large poultry houses, broiler sheds in 2016. And we then doubled up last year and went to eight sheds in total holding about 370,000 broiler chickens. So let, let's just stay with broilers, okay? Even the word, you know, conjures up um, something negative. So let's, it, it, you know, it doesn't get a great press, bit of a dirty word. Let, let's, let's talk about that and face up to it. Um, how, how would you respond to the challenge that housing, what must be then about 50,000 birds in, in a large shed, growing them as quickly as possible to get the turnaround for the next crop? How, how would you respond to the challenge that that really doesn't do anything to promote the vision of high animal welfare, high environmental sustainability agriculture that we're aiming for? Um, look, I'd, I'd, I'd probably look at the regulations that are only just being released now from um, birds outdoors being kept um, under nets, being being held indoors because of bird flu and, and the eminence of that being you know, spread by wild birds. But if you've got birds, if, if all our poultry was roaming outside, the risk to our food supply would be enormous. So actually, when I, I remember some of the horrors of the beasts from the east um, three springs ago, when you the pigs were the, the weeder side should be kept outdoors were being frozen to the ground. Um, my chickens are, are kept when they arrive as day-olds, 33 degrees. 
they have unlimited supply of water and, and feed. Um, I think that, yes, do I feel uncomfortable at the density of stocking at some point? I do. But actually, we stock in lower densities than most of our competitors. We have quite strict rules around welfare enhancement, which I think we, we honour and, and we try and stick to. But actually, at the end of the day, we're producing, I think, very efficiently, affordable food. And that, to me, is really critical. Are we, as a country, just going to, you know, shrug this off and say we don't like this and therefore it should happen somewhere else and we'll buy it from overseas or are we prepared to produce it locally make sure the standards are high as you said the welfare the environmental footprint of those farms is done correctly and when i look and we can come on to this in due course I look at some of the climate change challenges we face i think by putting production indoors where you can manage it really carefully does offer a real opportunity to manage our carbon footprint effectively. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an uncomfortable area at times when, when we, it's exactly the opposite to arable farming, bizarrely. Harvest with, with the cereals, you know, everyone comes, comes together and we celebrate gathering the harvest in. Our fun time is when we put the chicks in. Um, when the sheds get fuller and fuller, the birds get bigger, actually you're quite pleased to get them um, caught, taken away to the processing plant, the, 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 the for us, it goes down to Brackley, but that's, it's the reverse. When we start with a, a really pristine shed, we, we, we pride ourselves in not using antibiotics unless it's an absolute necessity um, and, and really do try and pursue that high wealth. But it's a very efficient system. And when you think that we can produce nearly 800 tons of chicken every seven weeks, and I say that, I'm conscious people could be criticizing me for that and it sounds horrendous. Um, we're feeding a lot of people very efficiently. I mean, it is. It does just bring joy to my heart to hear the word profitability. What one of the things I don't really understand is why ministers are, they're so silent on the success of the broiler uh, sector. They talk in sort of massage terms about the unsupported sector. They're very happy to talk about uh, genetics uh, to China, for example, and you know export successes of our you know pig genetics. But what is it do you think that you know makes them hesitant about actually talking about our intensive indoor production that produces you know quality at every you know, enables there to be a quality product at every price point for the consumer? Uh, look, look, I'm I'm absolutely convinced. You know, it, it, even to me, who's involved in it, you know, there's times when you think actually, well, this is. There's quite a lot of birds in these sheds. If you ask most producers, uh, you know, to, to, there's some really progressive farmers who have moved into broiler production. A lot of them would say actually having 30% um, less birds in a shed would be preferable. The problem is, you know, we're already below the European stocking rates. We know they're higher around the world in many cases. Um, and if you're only sort of 2%, um, fewer birds in a the shed, they'd known 30%, on seven crops or seven and a half crops a year, you'd be massively competitively disadvantaged. And if we're just going to, you know, if we're just going to bring that product in from abroad, not worry about how it's produced because we don't want it done here in the UK, I think that's a real shame. So I understand politicians not getting excited about it. I'm sure that many Conservative MPs with rural constituents would rather not have planning applications in for broiler farms. But actually, the regulations around impact on the environment are, are rigorous now. And what we are doing is producing what consumers want to buy in growing numbers. Yeah, I'm going to come to um, the Vice Chancellor, who's popped up with a question um, about ammonia emissions. Joe, are you able to unmute and ask that question directly at this, just at this point? It wasn't me, actually. Um, so I was just having a question for Peter. Um, I've been reading about the impacts of uh, ammonia emissions, especially from poultry farms. Um, and I'd like to know how you mitigate that in terms of reducing nitrogen deposition into the environment around you. So look, the, the, the licensing is incredibly strict on, on the production of uh, ammonia emissions. We can't abandon, we can't prevent it completely. Um, some new plants are now having scrubbers in um, the air that leaves the, the plant, so you're, you're reducing it. But actually, the, 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 the setup of modern sheds is such that we keep the, the litter incredibly dry. Uh, one of the main jobs of the guys on the farm is to, if there are damp patches in the sheds, it's the light to give more ammonia off. 
then, then they, they, they rebed the birds up. But, but because of the, the ventilation systems in these modern sheds, because we're able to use, a, we are using plenty of ventilation with renewable energy, that actually the, 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 the level of emissions is kept to a, a pretty low level. I, I can't get into the detail of the exact numbers, but it certainly would be more of an issue for older farms than newer farms. And as I said, planning regulations in, in the future are increasingly demanding that we put scrubbers that actually blast the, the air coming out of a shed through like a water um, sponge to take any of those particulates, particulates out, of the, out of the air. So it's, it's ongoing. I think we've made big inroads from the old, older farm, older sheds, um, but it's actually getting better all the time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, so let's let's get to the crux of the matter, Peter. And I, I, I'm just wondering how we square this circle. Uh, do we have intensive production um, on the on the one hand, and then nature recovery, carbon capture, the environment on the other? Is it is it a case of having some nets? And we've had Charlie Charlie Char, Charlie Burrell, X R A U, uh, speaking at a conference on rewild. Do we have a number of nets? Um, and then do we have some intensive production areas? You know, how are we going to square this circle in, in, in your view? I'm probably going to surprise you and I'm going to say, yes, we might, we will have more NEPs. Um, but I, 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 actually, I actually think we, we are going to have more intensive farming as well. And, and when I say intensive, and I've done this for some time, even when you were writing speeches for me, Julie, I would um, occasionally go off, um, off message you know, I talk about us massively intensifying, but that's not about with the use of more inputs. That's not about more fertilizer, more pesticides, more insecticides, etc. It's about management. It's about precision and management, how we recycle the nutrients that we have. And they might be nutrients from a poultry farm or an AD plant. But I do think an ability to rewild. And I think this is an uncomfortable vision for many that we will see some vertical farms um, that have the ability to, to, as I said, recycle nutrients that are, for some people, a blot on the landscape and exactly the way we saw wind turbines being argued against. I think they're coming probably back into favour now as we see climate change going up people's agenda. We will have to accept that if we want to spare land, if we want more area for wildlife, biodiversity, recreation, we're going to have to intensify elsewhere. And I can see us growing all sorts of products often quite near distribution centers because that'd be very easy to, uh, I hear people enthusiastic, so enthusiasts of vertical farms talking about slowing down and speeding up plants, you know, when the weather forecast dictates a, a certain demand pattern. I see a lot of that, but you know, when I see the intensity of my chickens and you see a food conversion rate of one and a half to one, so one and a half kilos of food produces one kilo of meat, um, you know, that to me is getting efficient. If we can then use that manure to, instead of me buying on my farm, my weaknesses would be fuel and inorganic fertilizer and probably my protein for my chicken. But if I can replace that organic fertilizer, inorganic fertilizer with chicken manure, wow, we're making big inroads. So I see systems agriculture building up, intensification. Why? To spare land for that, those other challenges we need to face. Yes, so let's just take a minute out and while people do pile in with your questions, we've got a couple of questions there, uh, but come on in, Peter's give you, given you plenty to have a go at now. But I just want to talk about regenerative agriculture then for a minute, Peter, because I mean, you know, we get, might have intensive units and then we might have our extensive and rewilding units, but actually regenerative agriculture is one of those things I've been amazed at how from the ground up commercial farmers you know clients of mine I mean they are getting excited and changing tillage patterns and soil management um what what, what are you you know what are you doing are you are you on this journey are you following it what, what am I doing I'm getting really excited about it's the first thing um I'm probably getting quite annoying to people I talk to my brother at least he, he wants to try new things I want to try new things probably because of it I'm, I'm reading books on organic farming, which you'd find amazing, wouldn't you, Julie, a few years ago? Um, not that I think organic farming is the answer, but I think there's things we can learn from each other as, as, we, as we make mistakes. And we, we farm some very heavy flat clay and how we try and use the direct drilling. We, we've had some crops that last year we, we didn't get drilled up. So we were able to spoil them. We got the mold in good conditions. We got a cover crop established. We put some muck on. We were able to be in there with a the drill in good conditions 
in the middle of September. We've now got some of the best looking wheat crops I've had for years. And even with the diabolical weather of December and January, you could walk across these fields, I exaggerate, but almost in low shoots. So the whole regenerative agriculture using cover crops, using roots, um, I start the, the journey with drainage. I think on our sort of soil types and, and, and um, topography, we have to get the, the drainage right as a starting point. But this is exciting stuff. And, and again, if I go back to my quest for net, net zero, pulling a direct drill with a 150 horsepower tractor rather than pulling up tons of soil with a 600 horsepower quad track, for example, is going to be a lot easier to power with biomethane or electric batteries or whatever as we have to meet a net zero outcome. So yes, brother and I are making mistakes. He disagrees with me on some things, we try different things, but actually, if you call it regenerative farming, I call it experimenting big time um, with, with how do we get to net zero. So um, folks do come in with uh, questions, particularly around regenerative farming or Peter's views on that sort of intensive and then extensive. We'd be very interested to hear what people think about that. So if we just- oh, Julie, can I just, sorry, yeah, just quickly, uh, one point on the, on the regenerative farming. One, one of the challenges, and there's one or two farmers we, we chat about locally about this issue. I, th I think there's a challenge. If you want to take land out of production, one, one is we're not being paid for those cover crops at the moment, or if you are, it's quite low payments in mid-tier. Yes, there's um, some, some options on, on two-year um, payments you know, for, for mid-tier. However, where this challenge gets really quite difficult is if you've got contract farming agreements, you know, if you take some of that land out or if you're going to rest it with a fallow and a cover crop, if you're renting land, it really doesn't stack up and it's the landlord's part of that equation. So there's a big discussion about how you do this. And I think we've been lucky that we were able to scale back some of our arable, cut our overheads because we had a complementary poultry business that was picking up some of that, if you like, management time or overhead um, that I think I'm, I'm viewed as. Great. Um, Peter, I've got a question in from John Wibberley, who I think you may know. Um, so John has a question. If you'd like to ask that question live, John. Uh, <clears throat> Hello. Yes, Hi, John, we can hear you. Hello, Peter. I've typed it out and I've forgotten what I've said, but basically I was absolutely agreeing with you about the importance of profitability in production agriculture. And uh, I've always argued, in fact, I wrote a paper about it in the college where I was teaching in 1970, the governors wanted to appoint a lecturer in conservation. And I said, no, 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 we should integrate conservation thinking into every aspect of husbandry, production husbandry that we're teaching. Uh, and I don't want to see people in the Cotswolds farming butterflies and bees while you guys in Bedfordshire get ulcers chasing 15 tonnes to the hectare of wheat. We, we want environmental management integrated in production and not um, in uh, rival corners like a boxing match. Peter? Yeah, no, John, we look, I'm, I'm amazed that discussion was going on in 1970. When I, when I came home and started farming in 19... 83, four time. Um, I, I will hold my hands up and confess I, I was a bit of a Peter Hepworth um, devotee to many of you who, who are old enough to remember Peter Hepworth who used to, oh, yes. take, his, used to take his wife out roving for a night out and yes. used, to, he used to take his nap like sprayer and, and spray under the bottom of every hedgerow. I, I decided that wasn't a great way to, to find a wife um, so I gave up on that as a, as a, as a, as a tactic. Um, but look, I, I think the whole you know, the whole farming fraternity, um, you know, wants to learn about how to improve their farms. Um, and, and when when you see some of the, that's why I talked about reading books on organic farming. The, the bit where I where I balk is when people say we just don't need to produce it here, and that generally really does rile me. There's, yeah, I think, yeah. the, latest, I think the latest numbers are, are sixty seven and a bit million people living on this crowded island. I think as you look, as, uh, look at a crazy world, you know, Putin's the biggest exporter of wheat in the world. Um, China, you know, grabs um, tracts of land in, in Africa. We see nationalism rearing its ugly head over vaccines. Um, as climate change bites, I see nationalism rearing its ugly head over food supplies. 
So I do passionately want us to be not self-sufficient, but I want us to value our agricultural um, infrastructure, um, mm. our farmers, the training of our farmers, the quality of our soil. Um, and mm. we just don't discard it and rewild it carelessly without a serious thought about what our plan is for feeding 67 million people on this island. So yes, we've got to do it hand in hand. And I think climate change is the biggest imperative of all. And that's why I am looking at the regenerative farming. It's why I'm looking for the synergies between our poultry business and the arable side of the farm. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm really excited about it, but we have to do it hand in hand with nature. And although I might have in my youth thought we could beat it up like a Peter Hepworth, um, I have, as I've got older, realised you have to work with rather than against um, nature and the environment. Great, and we're going to move straight to John Hoy, who's got a slightly different question, a uh, slightly tangential question, Peter. So, John, over to you. Peter, hi, good evening. Uh, very hi, good John. You. Very good to see you. Fascinated to hear about your poultry project, and it sounds as though it's been going to be and is a great success, and good to hear that you're doing renewables as well. But I'm interested in whether you've any appetite for tourism-related diversification, maybe holiday cottages or glamping or events or farm shops or the like, just to sort of fill in the rest of the jigsaw puzzle, if you like. Are you doing any of that? We, we're not. And um, although I get involved, so jo John has a farm not very far from us, uh, the other side of Royston. John's land was nice and chalky land, whereas ours was um, horribly flat, heavy clay. Um, but so, so I, I, I know John from, from old. Um, well, despite doing my NFU stuff, actually, I, I, don't, I don't want to necessarily have lots of people around me. So bit of an old curmudgeon at times when I finish doing what I've done. Do I want to be going out and nurturing the general public? I realise this is a public forum and I'm probably going to get myself in trouble for saying this. But we, we for a while, we ran a, a livery yard out of the back of the house here. And, and I'm going to be probably even remotely sexist now and, and point out to, to what went on. And, and on one occasion, the, 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 these, I think we had 10 horses out of the back. There were sort of seven or eight girls looking after the horses and they got scrapping. And one of the girls, who poor girl who got alopecia, got a wig, came to my door crying her eyes out because um, something had gone wrong in the livery yard. And I just thought, I can't, I, I'm not good at this sort of work. So the idea of having disgruntled tourists, John, having people who's, um, you know, something's gone wrong, doesn't, doesn't actually float, float my boat. But I am, you know, my, my nephew is a real people person, is a, is a great um, raconteur and, and loves being with people. Perhaps that might be something. Um, that the next generation look at, but but not for me. I see Julie's wanting to not tell any more inappropriate thanks, stories. Peter, before you dig any more holes for yourself. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 yes, so it's about playing to your strengths, really, as a, as a farmer. We've got another um, question in here. This is uh, Richard Barker. And again, we're on the question of intensification. Richard, would you like to pitch in? Yeah, certainly. Um, good evening, all. Um, I guess my question is around the criteria you choose for how to... Uh, distinguish between that land you might seek to intensively farm on and those bits where you might look at rewilding or, or, or other options. I'm just wondering how you'd make those decisions because it seems to me they could become quite subjective quite quickly. Yeah, they, 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 they do. And, um, and, I, and I think we, we have to have a, have a view as a, as a country about you know, what, what the plan is. And, and it's why I've, I've been frustrated for some time you know, Richard, about you know lack of clarity of ambition from government about what it wants. I don't know um, whether Henry Dimbleby's um, report's going to help clarify that. Um, but I, I do think we, we, we do need to have ambitions around food security, not necessarily self-sufficiency. I think we have to be clear about that. We should worry about what land we, we take out of production. We have to consider, I think, what's going to happen to sea level rise as well. So, you know, some of our best land is, is, is really under threat from flooding. Um, so, yes, it's, it's a really difficult question. And I think a lot of farmers will, will have to make those decisions themselves. And who knows how carbon markets might, um, you know, unfold and, and what they will reward farmers for. Um, but I do think we need to be really careful that we are seeing that um, other avenues of farming, and it could be, it could be synthetic meats, if you like, factory grown um, protein that, 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 that comes to the fore. Um, but we, we don't want to expose ourselves by taking big tracts of land out of production and not, not being able to have that security. As I, go, as I said before, this is a crazy world we live in. 
uh, very, very unstable, lots of nationalism and populism rearing its head around the world. I just would not want to be dependent on President Putin to be feeding us. That's, that's great. Thank you, Peter. And uh, we've got um, Charles Jeffrey Bridge, who would like to ask a question and make a point about the value of natural capital, BPS, stewardship, subsidies. So Ch Charles, you, you fire away live with your point and your question. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, you can. can. Oh, right. Um, Peter, I, I very much admire uh, the um, amazing farm business that you're running. I get the impression that DEFRA thinks there's a sort of um, average farm, average estate, and that um, there is a, no difference. Now, I did see a figure that the value of natural capital delivered by um, agriculture and forestry is three billion. Um, and yet, I, I, my understanding is that BPS and stewardship is about the same figure. How then is um, BPS and stewardship a subsidy when we're already providing uh, a similar value of natural capital? I, I, I think, Charles, because we're, we're, all, we're, we're going to be doing it almost regardless and, and, and government will pay for things it wants in addition, I suspect. Um, and, and look, I, I've been, you know, when we sit down as a family and, and look at what's coming around the corner, um, I've always tried to be realistic. I, I think we, we might end up uh, as, a, as a relatively large arable farm with maybe 30% of, of what we were getting as, as BPS. Who, who knows? But actually, I suspect a chunk of that 30% will cost me money to get. Now, whether in due course we can build up markets for carbon sequestration, and we have to be really careful about how we measure that and can we have the tools to demonstrate that we're, we're sequestering carbon, um, I think is a, is a really potentially exciting new market. But I would pose the question, I'm not sure we can sell carbon if we're not net zero already on our farms. So yes, there are markets out there, but I, I don't think we can be paid for the hedgerows or the woods we've got um, if they're in situ, they're protected, um, you know, as a, as a poultry farmer. I don't say pay me to look after, keep the water clean. Um, it's part of my planning application that in return for getting planning, you look after the water. You make sure that there's no runoff. You have tanks that, that, that capture water, et cetera. So you know, it's, it's, it would strike me as unusual that the government's going to pay us for what they might actually regulate us to do in future. Um, but I think if we can get farms to get into net zero, those hedgerows, the margins, the cover crops, the woods could well be a source of revenue once we've restructured how we farm. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have an anonymous question, so I'll ask it. Um, so here's, here's the question. It's still on sustainability of your own enterprise. You grow and feed your own grain to your chickens. Have you considered or looked at growing your own protein source, insects, rather than buying in soy, etc.? I've got I've got a I've got a Zoom call with a with a with an insect business tomorrow morning actually, Julie. So yeah, very excited by um, how we replace soya from uh, you know around the world. I'm not sure how you do it. I'm not sure whether it's so. There's there's a, there's a guy called uh, so I won't name him. But there's a farm not very far from me who's producing layers and he's doing some experimental work. And, and what they're doing is I think they're they're, they're using the, the insect larvae as a supplement. Um, to get more out of the lower protein feeds, which is interesting. The volumes you would need, and there's an, I understand there's a planning application just gone through in Northern France for something like a 240 million euro development. It's only gonna, only gonna produce 100,000 tons of insect dust a year. But again, um, when you talk to Andrew Swift up at Ferro, and he was part of the group um, that Joe talked about, the, 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 the industrial strategy um, group on, on farm productivity. Andrew Swift's doing some great work. We're exciting about turning insects into diesel replacement, into recycling byproducts and turning them into animal feed. So am I, I think I said, um, you said it's anonymous. I can't address the, the question directly. Are we looking at replacing soya? At the moment, we, we, aren't, we aren't in control of that. But in the same way as I'm aware that our weaknesses of our farm are inorganic fertilizer and diesel, 
protein being shipped from Brazil is also on my red list. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, actually, I think we had um, at our farm uh, one, one, 191 um, incubator unit, we had some research into insect proteins going on as well. I'm going to come to Sophie Carabin now. Um, who has a question again? We're going to. It's about you know intensity in intensive production. Um, so Sophie, over to you. Hello, Sophie. She hasn't pressed. She's on mute. Is she? Hello. Hi, Hi Peter. Hello. Hello. Um, Peter, do you think with the withdrawal of some products? and with pressure on soil health, some crops might just stop being produced in the UK. For example, sugar beet or oilseed rape, um, and I'm not gonna say potatoes, obviously. Um, and what do you think is the implication of that? What would be replaced? What would be the import substitution? What would be the implications overall for UK ag? Um, you know, if I, if I start with the premise and I'll try to, Sort of have this as a, a bit of a theme that net zero is is, is, is is the most pressing challenge that climate change is the biggest threat um globally um almost in a, in a rather small modest way i know bill gates has been making similar noises about the pandemic and, and what's happening around climate change um, i think that will drive some of these decisions more than the products being um withdrawn necessarily so when i look at and, and for a whole load of reasons, which I don't go into now, we've been growing some sugar beets on some pretty inappropriate land. You know, that is carnage for destroying soil structure, for releasing carbon. And although I talk to people on the plane who say their soil hasn't got a lot of structure and all the rest of it, I think our ability to try and not move large quantities of soil to make sure we capture carbon through regenerative agriculture, I think root crops will be looked at in, in, a, in a different way. And, and there, could, there might only be a small area of the country that can grow root crops in a sustainable, um, and I'm not even suggesting net zero, it might need a significant offset to achieve it. There was a video I picked up on, on, on YouTube of, I think it was in India, growing um, potatoes hydroponically um, by, by delivering that, you know, in, in again, enormous glass houses or factories producing potatoes where again, they were able to use robots to harvest them because they were in a con controlled environment. The soil wasn't being disturbed. I've got no idea what they tasted like, Sophie. I know you make a big thing of great tasting potatoes, but you know, I can see us doing a lot of, lot of our farming that damages the environment and climate change, having to be driven into more sustainable environments to grow them. Um, so thanks, Peter. We've got um, a question. Uh... Joe would like to come in to ask a question about intensive uh, production, I think, Joe, the Vice-Chancellor. So over to you, Joe, and then we'll go into David Rowlands after that. Peter, my, my question was really, sorry, I couldn't come in the Q&A, was about messaging, because even yourself today, you know, have, have used language which suggests we need to be a bit apologetic about the production of food in an intensive way. And how do we stop feeling that way and, and actually get a better message out about the fact that this is allowing people to eat healthily and reasonably cheaply because we've got a real poverty issue in this country as you as we know and it the gap is going to get wider as part of the post-covid agenda so 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 have you any thoughts on that because it feels like farmers as storytellers for want of a better word is critically important isn't it it, it is, Joe, and I look, there are some stories that I think are just very hard to tell. Um, you know, I remember in the days when we, you know, we used to have, 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 have sheep and we'd have the local schools around to see lambing and the number of mums who went away said, I'm never going to eat lamb ever again. So all the efforts to come and explain what we did, the lamb skipping across the, the meadows in the spring sunshine sent back, you know, more people who decided they weren't going to eat, eat lamb because of that. So I, I do think it's, it's a really difficult one. I, I would like to frame it more as the, as the, and I'm being very boring and repetitive about this, a lot of it around the climate change agenda, that if we want to capture our emissions, if we want to manage that environment really carefully, if we want to get really good food conversion rates and not have waste, 
then I think you do put production inside. You do have to have that debate. And we should as farmers as well, you know, use things like Open Farm Sunday. You know, our neighbours have got a poultry farm, not neighbours, are the nearest poultry farm to us. You know, had a really, really successful Open Farm Sunday a few years ago. Um, and a lot of people came out saying, wow, I had no idea what was going on. Almost any walker I stop and I talk to next to my poultry farm, they usually sit there, jaw open. It is easier to win people over when the birds are in their first two weeks than when they're in their last week in a shed. So I remain slightly, not apologetic, but cautious in how I tell that story. But I think I would bank on the how we use resources efficiently because of net zero and saving the planet and link it into your really critical message about healthy, affordable food. Because what we haven't got to be done, done we, we mustn't do, is be hijacked by food snobs who don't think this is good enough. And you make people who are on limited budgets feel guilty about those food choices. Um, yeah, some of this might well be taken over by synthetic proteins and, and, and you know, plant-based meat replacements, et cetera. But I think that's quite a way off to do that affordably to replace chicken, particularly when you can get one, in, even in Waitrose, for £3.50. I think the equivalent chicken is probably three quid in test tubs. This is feeding a big chunk of the United Kingdom. No, I, I agree. And I think if we could put some data on how much, you know, you can save, you know, emissions by not by bringing, you know, chickens in from overseas and put some figures on that, it could be a story. I think it's a critical way of doing it, isn't it? Is actually, and also good stories about welfare, I think, but it's hard. It is hard to do it. You can't do it in the same way as having people around gambling lambs. You can't do that, can you? So no. it has to be done more with, with, I think, the data messaging to young people about those sorts of issues. And again, as Sophie said, if we can shorten supply chains by growing protein sources, that's a great story, isn't it, if we can manage it? Very good. In the interest yeah. of uh, trying to give everyone the opportunity to ask their question, we're going to come to... Um, David Rowlands and then Rachel Hallos and then Nick Chard as it's a slightly different question on planning. David, you've kept us in suspense as to what your question is, but the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you very much. My technical expertise didn't allow me to print the question. I can remember as a student 60 years ago being taught the notion of podsolarization, which would involve the inevitable decline of soil quality until eventually it became unusable. I thought at the time it was an unacceptable um, a process. Uh, I think perhaps one of the best changes of recent years is the recognition that the answer lies in looking after the soil. Would Peter care to comment? A hundred percent. You know, my um, we 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 farm some pretty flat, heavy clay. Big chunk of it was cleared by Polish immigrants at the end of the. Uh, well, during the Second World War, uh, my late uncle wrote one of the definitive books on land drainage. And in the opening passage of his book, he, he said his father died when he was 12. And he was taught from an early age that the, the removal of surplus water from our heavy clays was all that kept them from the poorhouse. So from an early age, the soil has been ingrained in, in, in me as, as an important part of the structure. I, uh, look, I hold my hands up. Um, I'm 60 years old. And it's probably only in the last 10 years that I've really, really started to, you know, smell the soil in a way that we never used to, um, that we want to get the weight off the soil. We want to nurture it in a way. But I, you know, I'm one of the old kids now. Um, there's a lot of people out there, the younger generation, who are doing some really exciting stuff, um, sometimes on easier soils than we are. And it might mean we have to do things differently. Um, but boy, do I think everything starts with the soil and how we look after it. Great. Uh, Rachel Hallos, again, you, you've got a question about natural capital, Rachel. Do you want to um, pitch that one? I will do. Good evening, everybody. Uh, just a quick question for you, Peter. I'd be really interested in your opinion on um, should the industry stop relying on government funding and actually start embracing private sector funding for natural capital because there's a big, big push for that sort of thing these days. So I just, I'm intrigued to know what you think. Hi, Rachel. Um, yeah, I, look, I, I just, I'm, I'm worried that the markets aren't ready for what is available. Um, what I would be 
really, and I had this conversation actually with one of your colleagues from, from the NFU, um, Rachel, where, where we, we had the discussion about as we get into even mid-tier schemes, as we get into ELMS, do we, if we're not careful, preclude ourselves from future ability to trade some of that natural capital benefits? Um, I think we need to be able to measure it really clearly. So I think that's a, a really exciting opportunity in how we measure what natural capital is being delivered, what the biodiversity gains are, what the carbon sequestration is, et cetera. Um, but I think it's only in its infantry, yeah, sorry, infancy, and, and how we actually make those markets work, you know, is, is just a, an enormous opportunity. But I don't think we need to, we, we mustn't lose sight. I still think my primary purpose as a farmer is to feed people, but it's linked with doing it in a sustainable way. And if there's other markets available on the back of it, it goes back to John Hoy's question about, um, you know, getting tourism involved. You know, we, we're, we're 15 miles from Cambridge, 40 miles north of London. If my nephew wants to come back and try these sort of areas, fantastic. But it's, a, it's, it's an addition to my core job, which is feeding people. And the, and the natural capital bit could be an addition, but I wouldn't want to get suckered into it in, in time. Yeah, thank, thank you, Peter. Right, we've got three more questions, folks, and no time for any more, just so that we get you away on time uh, for supper. So I'm um, over to Nick Chard, slightly different question now. Nick, over to you. Yeah, thank you. But Peter, I used to farm in the 80s and I diversified as we all were encouraged to do. And one thing that I kept coming up against was planning and planning officers. I actually became an elected member about 24 years ago. You're, you, you are now going into quite intensive uh, farming. Uh, we have a lot of intensive farming in Kent. One thing that troubles me, though, is I don't think farmers are good enough communicating to planning officers and decision makers about what they want to do and why they want to do it in good enough time to, to, for, for them to plan forward. Um, and I'm sure that would help farmers around the country to actually do what they want to do, but, but they're not but they're not explaining themselves well enough. I, I know the NFU helped me a great deal, but I would like your opinion on where you, where you think you are with uh, relationships with, with, with your planners. We're incredibly lucky. This, the site I, I, I picked for our broiler farm is on the furthest most corner of, of, of East Bedfordshire. Um, it's actually one field away from Hertfordshire and one field away from Cambridgeshire. So the consultations took part in Bedfordshire and no one in Cambridgeshire or Hertfordshire was asked, um, which was incredibly fortunate because, um, you know, the, the village of Asheville is, a, is, is quite a, a strong um, commuter village, um, affluent commuter village. Um, and I've had some pretty disparaging remarks made about what we've done. Um, so I understand the challenges. I, I wonder if anyone ever wants a broiler farm in their backyard. I think that's quite difficult. Therefore, I think we do have to, you know, we have to start right back at what I said a moment ago about ambition from the industry and from government of what we want to achieve, what, how much food we want to produce. And then we have to pick areas where we, where we make those investments and we accept that has to occur. It's interesting how a lot of broiler farms are on old disused airfields um, because there are large open areas where people weren't objecting. Um, I, I've not, I, I, look, I, I, we discussed earlier on about me having fewer chickens in my sheds. There's a better chicken commitment that would reduce my stocking density by 30%. And they would grow slower. It's also part of that commitment. If that needed 30% more chicken sheds building around the countryside, they would almost all be in conservative constituencies. So what a dilemma we have. Do we want our chickens to have a bit more space? And when we... Um, there was a, 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 a large farming business up in north of Bedfordshire wanted to build a, a broiler farm. Um, even Theresa May raised this under, under Prime Minister's questions. It's just a massive hot potato, which I don't think you win people over, however much we tell them we need the production. Great, thank you. I'm going to John Payne. Quick question from you, John. Thanks very much, Julian. Peace, a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my question relates to the sort of free trade um, 
I'm aware that farmers, particularly in the US, are very eager to gain access to our markets uh, once there's a free trade deal with the US. I think a lot of the debate recently has been around protecting food standards, but I'd be interested in your point of view in terms of, do you see there's an opportunity for us to actually do a better job of promoting British produce to consumers? And just hold that, Peter, because if Myrick is there, Myrick, can you come in with your question as well? Yes, could you hear me, Julie? Yes. Hello, hello, Peter. I enjoy. Hi, Mark. I, I didn't know you went to college. I didn't. I've been listening <laughs> to you and learning from you over the years. <laughs> My question is fairly short. <laughs> I just wonder how concerned are you with some of the government messaging for more in extensive agriculture, and this will probably not give our food processors the confidence required to put in the investment to increase the efficiency of their sort of processing. Because at the end of the day, if they don't feel confident in investing, then they find it easier to import the finished product from overseas. How concerned are you? Those are the final questions, Peter. Look, they're very, and I'll try and tie them both together. When you, when you look at a, a chunk of the Conservative Party today, you know, they're, they're the children of Margaret Thatcher. They want to finish her work. So I, I really do worry that they are free trade extremists where they do what they do think that throwing markets open will make us more efficient. And if we're not efficient enough, we'll go out of business. And I, I think it's quite a brutal argument being made. And, and where I, I really worry is if we go back to my previous point about if we haven't got a clear ambition, if we don't want to feed 67 million people in a sustainable way, God, it's going to be high risk in this you know, uncertain world we live in. So I'm, I am really worried that we lose processing. And the moment you get confused messages, processors will move and they'll go somewhere else. And I, and I think some of the, the trading confusion challenges that are occurring over Brexit could well take people to process food else, elsewhere. Um, I'm just trying to remind myself, Julie, of the, the previous question about the trade deal. Yeah, you know, about I, I, I do think there's going to be, and someone much brighter than me put this to me the other day, the, 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 there's going to be a clash between the, the promises that we keep hearing from government about protecting UK standards and the urgency to do trade deals. Um, and at some point, you know, I, I have a horrible fear that because of the economy, the, the fallout that's going to occur, we, we could get trade deals that really undermine domestic production. And, and I don't think we can argue purely on protection grounds, but if we have dumping, if you try and build and invest and you need confidence, it's probably the, after soil and, 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 and investment, confidence is absolutely critical. But if government doesn't give the clear signals, I worry about processing, I worry about trade deals, but Julie's winding me up. I'm gonna finish with one last comment. Despite all of that, I think farming is gonna go through a really, really exciting time. And I wish I was 20 years younger. Like you, June. <laughs> yes, thank you, Peter. Thank you for that. Look, Peter, thank you for wrapping up on a positive note, because that is quite a sombre sort of warning, you know, amber light there on, on trade deals. Um, I just want to thank you very much for your time. And I'm going to and thank everyone for coming this evening. But I'm going to hand over to Lewis Bebb, who heads up our student union just to uh, conclude this evening but thanks that's all from me everybody and over to you Lewis. Uh, thank you Julie and also thank you Peter and uh, for everybody who asked the uh, some very personal questions as well. Um, I know as a, a Bruyne farmer's son I know all of the points that you were raising Peter especially about putting the uh, fresh litter down that really resonates with me I could tell you now. Um, you know as sort of a, as a, on that as a third generation uh, chicken farmer up here in North Wales um, you know, the farming which my grandfather did in the 70s, if you like, has, has changed a lot and has evolved with the times as well. And it'd be interesting to see uh, what the farming is going to be like for, for my brother when he takes up the reins. But again, I uh, just want to say thank you to you both. And a small reminder about the next lecture is on the 13th of April with uh, Christine Takon, uh, sort of the recent chair of the Red Tractor and also with a, an RAU graduate um, with Max Pim, uh, Pittman. Uh, looking at sort of um, all the other bits of sort of into agriculture as well. So just want to put you to that since the 13th of April and I'll hand over to uh, Joe Price, Vice-Chancellor. 
Well, I'd just like to say that I'm incredibly impressed, Julie and Peter, for the fact that you've managed to bring us right up to the hour. It was an absolutely wonderful uh, double act because um, it was really impressive. And uh, Peter, thank you very much for giving up your time. I think you've really stimulated some fantastic questions and uh, I think a lot of food for thought there. So look forward to seeing you all next time, everyone. And goodbye. And thank you, Lewis, for the wrap up. So goodbye, everybody. And thank you for your contributions and uh, see you next time. <laughs>